Okay, I'm going to start off with chapter one of calculus. And if you have any questions in the middle, just um, either message me in the chat or unmute and ask, and I'll answer them. I'm going to start off by just reviewing a few concepts. Um, starting with the review of pre-calculus. So pre-calculus is mainly about functions and introducing calculus. So since chapter one is like a review of pre-calculus, it also has a bit of um, review. For example, we have um, the rates and distance. Basically, it's using velocity and position uh, as applications of what we did in pre-calculus. For example, if we have a curve that um, looks something like this, then what calculus tells us is that if this is the position um, graph, basically x represents position in this case, that means that the slope of this graph is the velocity. And if we have a graph that's velocity and this is time, then the area under the curve is position. So it basically shows you the relationship between position and velocity. In pre-calculus, there's a lot more detail before this, but calculus um, thinks or assumes you already took pre-calculus. So it just jumps straight into um, the relationship between them. Now, some other uh, reviewing concepts are volumes. So these are actually going to be coming later in calculus, like second semester maybe, uh, because you, if you learn how to use area in calculus, area under the curve, you'll soon have to do volume um, based on the concept you already learned. So some basic volume formulas, when you have a cylinder, the volume is uh, pi r squared h. Um, when you have a sphere, it is four third pi r cubed. Uh, when you have a cone, it is one third pi r squared h. And then the two other main ones are prisms and uh, pyramids. So prism, let's just say it's a rectangular prism. It can be anything. The area, uh, the volume is going to be base times height. So you find the area of the base. So in this case, of the square, it'll be relatively easy. But that's why I generalized it for all prisms. It could be like a hexagon or anything. You find the base area and you multiply it by the height. And finally, we have a pyram uh, pyramid. Again, it's base times height. But this time, like with the cone, it's one third base times height. And those are basic volume formulas uh, from like geometry. Now, let's go into functions a bit. Um, functions are like relationships between two variables, x and y mostly. And um, I'm not gonna go into like the basics of functions, but how they are applied in calculus. So linear function is a line. It can be any slope, any y-intercept, and those two, constants uh, determine the slope intercept form. So y is equal to mx plus b is the slope intercept form of a line. Uh, parabolas are quadratic equations, so x squared. Uh, we have square roots, we have exponential equations. Um, we also have logarithmic, which logarithmic, which are inverses of exponential. Um, we have absolute value, which is also pretty important. But one more thing that I want to talk about functions are piecewise functions. And piecewise functions come more in depth in chapter two when we're talking about limits. Uh, but piecewise functions are basically split up into multiple parts. So let's say something like this. It's made up of multiple different functions. So first a square root function, then a line, and then, for example, a, a, a quadratic function. This is an example of a piecewise function. And one important thing about this specific piecewise function is that it's called continuous because at these points of interest, there is no change in y value. So they both have the same y value here and here. So the definition of continuity for like algebra two and pre-calculus is basically, can you draw it on paper without lifting your pencil? If so, then yes, it's continuous. A graph like a rational function uh, which I forgot to mention earlier, but also are a vital part of calculus, is not continuous because you have to draw one part and then draw the other. Similarly, if you have a hole in the middle, it's not continuous. Or if you have um, 
just a change in y value, that's also not complete. Now, there are some other basics of um, algebra that were reviewed in chapter one, such as domain and range and other important uh, topics with functions. One thing I do want to talk about is asymptotes and, um, and behavior. So when you have a rational function, for example, let's say this is your rational function. There are a few main uh, things to talk about. Vertical asymptotes are what make your denominator equal to zero. So if you have x in the denominator and like one in the numerator, that means uh, your vertical asymptote would be x equals zero because that's what make the denominator zero. Now there's one thing to watch out for though, because there are, there could be holes. If you have something like x times x minus three over x, that doesn't mean that x is a vertical asymptote because the x can be canceled out and you'll be left with x minus three. Now this isn't just an equation of a line because of this x that used to be here. Since there used to be an x in the denominator, you must specify that x is not equal to zero in this case. And so you will end up with the equation of a line with a hole at x equals zero, and then it continues on like that. That's why it doesn't form a vertical asymptote in this case, because it can be canceled out. Now, there's also horizontal asymptotes. Um, that's probably what you learned in pre-calculus. There's horizontal asymptotes and vertical asymptotes. In calculus, we actually go beyond a bit, and we say end behavior asymptotes instead of horizontal asymptotes. In most cases, it will be a horizontal asymptote, uh, but it's basically saying, what does the graph look like when it's going to infinity and negative infinity? In this case, it's approaching, uh, let's say, 2, for example. This is the horizontal asymptote, and um, we'll get into a few rules for this later, but there's a possibility that your end behavior asymptote is not a horizontal asymptote. Let's say you have a function with an end behavior asymptote of a line. It could look something like this. As x approaches infinity and negative infinity, the graph sort of takes on the shape of the line. So now um, we have end behavior asymptotes, but how do we find it? That's where the equation comes in, and there are a few rules given for that. Let's, let's say you have x to the power of 2 over x to the power of 1. In this case, the x to the power of 2 overrules the x to the power of 1, and it'll be going towards infinity as x approaches infinity and negative infinity as x approaches negative infinity. Basically, it's not going to have a set asymptote that's horizontal. It's going to go towards infinity on both sides. So it would be a line in this case. Since 2 is just 1 degree greater than 1, it would result in some sort of line as an end behavior. Asymptote. Of course, you could have other end behavior asymptotes as well that are more curved instead of um, going towards a line. Uh, but when it's one degree greater than the denominator, it's uh, end behavior. The end behavior asymptote is line. Second case is when the numerator is actually has a degree less than the denominator. This means it approaches zero on both sides. And a good example of this would just be one over x. The um, reciprocal function or rational function, uh, the basic one. Since there's a power of zero in the numerator and power of one in the denominator, it approaches zero on both sides since the denominator is greater. There's one more case, and that's when you have a times x to the power of two, for example, it can be any degree. I'm just using two in this example. And another constant times x to the power of two. In this case, the horizontal asymptote would be the ratio of these two coefficients. So if I had 2x squared and negative 3x squared, the end behavior asymptote of this would be a horizontal asymptote such that y is equal to negative 2 over 3 because that's the ratio of the coefficients. While we're on the topic of horizontal asymptotes, um, there is something similar to this that is covered in chapter 2 of um, calculus with limits, and that's dominant terms. That was briefly covered in pre-calculus, but it basically helps you find the limit as x approaches infinity for some functions. It's also related to this because it uses uh, dominant terms. In this case, when we had something like x cubed, that's the dominant term over x squared, and that's why it goes to zero. However, um, when we talk about this in chapter two, 
there are extensions of this. So you include exponentials and logarithmics and things like that, um, because those can be accounted in limits as well. But for now, we're just talking about um, rational functions with just powers of x. So chapter one goes a bit more into um, some technical things like approach statements and slope statements, which I'm not really going to cover because um, approach statements are basically an introduction to limits. It's basically saying like, as x approaches some number, um, y approaches another number. That's basically what an approach statement is. And a slope statement is basically a general description of the function over an interval. So if you have something like this, you can say it's decreasing until it flattens out, then it's increasing, flattens out, and then it's decreasing. You might want to go a bit more in detail. That's the gist of what a slope function is. Uh, sorry, a slope statement. Now, um, back to functions. There's just a few more reviewing of pre-calculus, and that's just like composite functions and inverse functions. When you have uh, two functions such that the input of one function is the other function itself, that's a composition of functions. This is uh, one of the most common ways of writing it. You can also say f, and then this dot, and then g of x. And that represents g of x as an input of f of x. But what these basically mean is that you're inputting in g of x instead of x. So if you have like x squared is f of x, and g of x is 2x, what you're basically doing is you're putting 2x in place of this x. So your new composition would be 2x squared or 4x squared uh, when you simplify. Of course, there's a simple example. There are more complicated ones. But the reason this is important is because in calculus, you get some rules uh, to find the derivatives, for example, of some functions. But you, for example, you can find the derivative of 2x using calculus and sine x. Both of these you're given um, rules for. But what if you have sine of 2x? You're not given a rule specifically for that, but that's where you use composition of functions. You say the inner function is 2x, the outer function is sine x, and then you use composition. And there's a rule that lets you take the derivative of composition. Of and that's why that's important. And inverse functions, there's also a similar rule for inverse functions. Um, and brief recap of inverse functions, it basically happens when the composition of a function and another function equals x. So it's notated f inverse of x. And if you take the composition of f of f inverse of x, you're resulted with x. So that is the um, basic definition of inverse functions. The way you find it is you swap x and y in an equation and then solve for y. The result is the inverse function. But there are some technicalities with the domain restrictions. But that was covered in pre-calculus. So I'm not going to go too in-depth. In Another thing about inverse functions is that when you draw the graph of a function, for example, quadratic, uh, not that great of an example because there are domain restrictions with quadratics, but um, the inverse is basically the same function reflected across the line y equals x. So this is the inverse of x squared. Of course, since there's a second portion to this, you have to do a domain restriction on the quadratic function to make sure that this inverse is a function. Otherwise, it would not be a function. This fails the vertical line test. Um, and therefore, you need to do, uh, restrict the domain. There are other things to do with functions, such as even and odd functions. I'm not going to go into that because that's algebra and pre-calculus. Um, a lot of uh, algebra was dedicated to functions. So I'm not going too in-depth into that. Um, I'll do a little review of trigonometry because we might need some. I'm not going to go into the identities, but basically there's sine, cosine, tangent. Their reciprocals are cosecant, secant, and cotangents, respectively. And all of those six have inverses you're going to learn a rule for a derivative for all 12 of these functions, the six original ones, uh, and each of their inverses. And that seems like a lot of rules, so it is, but uh, you're going to have to memorize it or at least like find some way to derive it um, on the spot because it is, yes, a lot of memorization, more than just like a polynomial. There's just one rule for that, but um, it is good to know because you never know what function they're going to ask you to uh, take the derivative. Last thing um, for chapter one is just going back to what I said at the start, distance and velocity or position and velocity. We're also introducing acceleration. So for example, let's say we have 
uh, line, this represents the velocity. The area under this line, or in general, a curve later in calculus, is going to be the position. So when you have this area right here, this is the displacement or change in position. In calculus, you can also say distance, but in physics, distance and displacement have kind of a difference in meaning. So uh, I generally wouldn't use distance. Um, I would more so stick with the displacement because that's technically more accurate. But this is the change in position over this time interval. Now, how do you find the acceleration given the velocity? Well, that's the slope of this line. Since it's a line, its slope is constant everywhere, and you're going to end up with constant acceleration. Some horizontal line is your graph of acceleration. But let's say you have a quadratic graph for your velocity. Of course, finding the area under the curve is much harder. We'll get into that in chapter two. But uh, finding the slope of it is also significantly harder because this is kind of horizontal. This is going more steeper until it actually gets really steep um, near the end. So the slope is always changing. How are we supposed to find the slope of that? Calculus, therefore, is split into two groups. One is finding the slope of curves, or a function that describes the slope of curve at a point. And the second part is to find the area under the curve over an interval. And yeah, chapter one, therefore, introduces these two concepts using applications such as position, velocity, and acceleration. That's it for chapter one. Um, does anyone have any questions that I need to answer? Can you like go over how to do like um like those flag problems from chapter one? Oh, okay, sure. Maybe like so. W the flag problems basically give you a shape. So let's say a rectangle, and it says there's a pole here, and it's rotating this shape around the pole. It seems insignificant. How does that have to do anything to do with calculus? But it will be used in calculus later on when you're rotating a curve around an axis to find the volume generated by that, but that's going too far. What this basically says is, if you were to rotate it, how would it be? There's no real method for this. You just have to imagine what it would look like. So think of you rotating a piece of paper around the pool. The point on this very most edge starts here and then keeps on rotating around until it makes a circle. So you know, it, it's a circle up here. And this point is also a circle because it's the same, uh, it's kind of the same point as the point above here. And this one is just a line. So when a line rotates, it just stays in line. So you know it's going to be a cylinder. Um, if you're not too comfortable with like imagining it in your head, you might want to memorize it. A rectangle, when rotated, forms a cylinder. When you have a triangle, it forms a cone because this is um, a circle like before. But this is just a point. It's on the line itself and therefore it doesn't rotate. And you're stuck with a point on the top, so it's a cone. If you have a semicircle rotated around this way, you have a sphere, and so on. Uh, so if you want, you can memorize that, or you can just imagine it in your head while doing the problem. But once you've done that, now you have to find the volume of this figure. If you were given the dimensions of the rectangle, say two and six, you know that this center point is the center of the cylinder because the pole is the symmetry of the uh, cylinder. That's how you created the cylinder, by rotating around. So it must be the center of the cylinder. Therefore, the distance from the center to the edge is two because that was the width of the rectangle that you created. And the height stays six because that didn't really change once you rotate it. Again, it's just imagining it. You have to be careful on how you know which distances changed, which didn't, and where the lengths are in this new um, figure that you created. Now, you're given a cylinder, and then you use the volume formulas I talked about earlier to find the volume of this. It's pi r squared h. So you plug it in, pi times 2 squared times 6. And simplifying it, you get 24 pi um, units cubed. Always remember the units cubed when you're doing volume, units squared when you're doing area, and just units in general um, for any problem. Does that answer your question? Yeah, OK, thanks. I got it. OK. Uh, one more question someone had was, if you're given a curve, um, let's say something like, oh, something like this, and you're asked to find the area of part of it, um, this 
is technically a more advanced calculus concept, but this is a special case because it's a semicircle and semicircles are geometry. We know how to find the area of a circle and therefore a semicircle. Um, but the question is asking how to find this area over here. So um, I'm just going to go in depth into that, how the, uh, what the process is. Um, so a kind of accurate drawing is kind of needed for this. Let's say this is, the radius is uh, 10 for example, and you're trying to uh, find the area from five to 10, what would you do? Well, let's break it down into some parts. Obviously you can draw this uh, segment creating a right triangle, but that's not part of this area that you're trying to find. But you realize not only does this segment create a right triangle, it also creates this part of a circle called, um, uh, this is the arc, this is the sector of the circle. And in geometry, we learned how to find the area of a sector of a circle. What it basically is, is if this is some angle theta, the area is gonna be theta over 360, if you're in degrees, times whatever the area of the general circle is. So how do you calculate what this um, angle is? Well, you know, this is five, and you know, this is 10, because that's the radius. Five, 10, uh, I see a five root three over here because it's a 30, 60, 90 triangle. Always be in the lookout for special triangles. When you have five and 10 here, and this five root three, what angle must this be? It's 60 degrees. Um, again, if you're not comfortable with this, you might want to use like trigonometry or draw a triangle out and um, use Pythagorean theorem to find the third side and then uh, to find 60 degrees. Or if, you're, um, if you memorize the different angles for trigonometry, you would know this is 60 degrees since it's opposite of the five root three. 60 degrees, so 60 over 360 is one sixth times the area. What's the area? Well, the radius is 10 and the area of a circle is pi r squared. So 10 times, 10 squared times pi is 100. So 100 pi times one sixth, that's some fraction. So that's the area of this sector, but we want just this part of the sector. So that's where this right triangle we created earlier comes in. If you take the area of the big sector and subtract the area of the triangle from it, you get what the, the area you were looking for. So this, you can simplify it down to 50 pi over three minus, and what's the area of this right triangle? Well, it has a base of five and a height of five root three. So five times five root three, and then remember divide by two because it's one half base times height. So this is 25 root three over two. And this isn't the best example because I just made up numbers on the spot. So this is um, not that nice of an answer. You just get a bunch of fractions and pi's and square roots, but this would be your answer. And remember, unit squared. So that would be your answer for this problem if you were to uh, calculate the area of this part. Any other questions on uh, chapter one? Um, yeah, um, I have one thing. So like when Ogul was doing this, um... Uh, he didn't like directly do uh, 60 over 360. I think he did 180 minus 60, which is 120. And then he divided that over 360. So that gives like the fraction. So like, I don't think it's 60 over 360. Um, I don't know why he would do 180 minus 60. Because that is this angle here. Maybe he was... I don't know, talking about a different problem where um, the area is in this segment, but I still don't see why he would do 180 minus 60. Um, oh, sorry, yeah, I was doing a different way, right? So like um, I did that and then I did uh, one half pi r squared minus the fraction pi r squared minus one half base times height. Yeah, this is also like a different way. Sorry, I, I was confused with my view and your Okay. Okay, if there aren't any other questions, then moving on to chapter two. So chapter